Okay, the income tax system may end because of this man's case. Thomas Freed here, and I've got a story today about a ta tax case that's going on out in Utah that has the potential to end the federal income tax because of the circumstances of the case behind today's ongoing criminal trial. So, Without further ado, let's just get right into it. This is Thomas Freed. This is going to be posted on the tax-freedom.com website if you want to read the article. I actually told half this story the other day on my Truth Attack radio show, which is a Thursdays at 6 online at the Liberty Works Radio Network.com website. And the hourly radio show episodes are being posted on the Thomas Freed YouTube channel. If you want to hop over and check those out, you should because we're broadcasting and releasing the information that's been hidden from the American people for over a hundred years to deceive them about the true nature of the income tax and your duties under that law. Okay, so here we go without further ado. Everybody in America knows that there is something very, very wrong with the way that the IRS operates. And the way that the federal courts have been letting them get away with it, too. This case exposes it all. So, <clears throat> do you believe in God or government? That is the true question. And to that end, an American patriot, Ken Cromar, who does believe in and has faith in God and not government, needs both your help and your support. But he is not asking for your money as he sits today in jail on false charges. Only your help in publicizing this story, exposing the blatant sedition and treason being committed in the federal courts by the weaponized against Americans, DOJ, the Department of Justice, and the federal court judges being done in the name of tax only, under color of law and color of judicial office. So please, if you find this story as hard to believe as I do, as outrageous and inconceivable in America as I do, please share this information with others, share the video, urge the media to pick up the story and broadcast it to America, like the video, and do anything else you can think of to help this American patriot expose the truth about the 16th Amendment and the federal personal income tax while faithfully pushing forward under God's plan to set all Americans free once more, specifically free from the subversion and perversion of our constitution and tax laws that is currently occurring in the name of tax and color of law, to tax labor, not profit or income which taxation he is fighting against in a truly valiant effort to restore the enforcement of the constitutional limitations that are imposed by the Constitution on the taxing powers and all federal taxes, which limitations have been violated and destroyed by the perverse, subversive, and seditious income tax as it is wrongfully enforced today by the IRS, DOJ, and lower federal court judiciary, where it is enforced as a direct tax on labor under the 16th Amendment without any applicable limitations, which was never intended and cannot be for the irrefutable lack of an enabling enforcement clause therein. This unauthorized enforcement of an ungranted power to tax without limitation is an administrative and judicial crime against America, being treasonously committed in the lower federal district courts, in the circuit courts, in the IRS, in the DOJ, all across America. Now only God, by truth, can save we the people. So will you help spread the truth? Mr. Cromar is a true American patriot from Utah currently being held in jail pending federal criminal trial on three false tax charges that are entirely inappropriate by the language of the statutes themselves and which charges are not supported by the facts of the dispute. 
and this criminal trial has already begun. It began this week and is ongoing, so we need to get this story out. But to begin our story, we should probably review at least some of the factual history between these two litigants, Mr. Cromar and the United States. In the beginning, Ken Cromar did nothing more than exercise his constitutional rights to due process at law, to be secure in his person, houses, papers, and effects as provided under the Fourth Amendment, and to not be compelled to testify against oneself by asking the government, as, as provided for in the Fifth Amendment, by asking the government, the IRS, the DOJ, and the federal courts, before filing any tax return at all for any year, to show him how, under the law, it is and can be shown today and positively determined from what's in the law that a Form 1040 is a form or the form that is actually required by law to be filed by an American citizen living and working in the 50 states of America in order to satisfy the legal filing requirement associated with the federal personal income tax imposed under Title 26, United States Code, that's the IRC, Section 1, Tax Imposed. And because the collective United States government refuses to address and answer that question, Ken has refused to abandon his faith in God and has not filed any tax returns for over 25 years because no one from the government, the DOJ or the judiciary, can or will explain using the law rather than simply because we say so, how the determination of the requirement of the filing of a specific form, i.e. the 1040, has been made from the provisions of the law? Or is there maybe some other actual requirement that has been kept hidden from the American people for 85 years? Or is it simply because that is the form the IRS puts in the U.S. Post Office every year for everyone to use? Is it law or is it habit, custom, historical practice, and possibly myth? The details in this criminal case reveal the truth about all of these things. But time and space limitations here to try and generate publicity around the case act to prevent further investigation of those details herein. So, against that background of simply asking a reasonable question about the laws that the DOJ alleged existed, but would not identify, repeatedly refusing to do so, the DOJ filed a civil suit against Mr. Cromar in 2018 to foreclose on he and his wife Barbara's home and property. Yes, that's right, it's Ken and Barbie. However, at the civil trial, the DOJ refused to properly establish the subject matter jurisdiction of the court that could be lawfully taken by the court over the civil tax enforcement action, claiming jurisdiction could be taken under statutes alone without any need to identify the specific constitutional foundation for the claim that tax was owed. In other words, they refused to identify if the tax they were pursuing the civil enforcement of in the court was direct or indirect, or if it was an impose, a duty, an excise, or something else. They refused to argue further, insisting jurisdiction could be taken under statutes alone. This, of course, is painfully absurd as any and every claim for tax must be grounded in the constitutional foundation of a specific power to tax, which must be identified as granted, or the defendant has not been properly informed of what tax he is accused of failing to pay. And the tax claim thus becomes vague, arbitrary, and capricious as an unidentified and undefined tax claimed owed without specific constitutional foundation, as the statutes invoked by the United States to establish jurisdiction allegedly, typically reference the enforcement of, quote unquote, any tax. 
Okay, they can enforce any tax. Now, please tell Ken and all the other defendants in America which tax it specifically is that is claimed owed. But in the district court in the civil action in 2018, the government refused to disclose that fact or argue further. And the district court refused itself to make them speak or perfect the argument by putting constitutional foundation under it. When Cromar refused to answer the vague and arbitrary complaint, the civil complaint for tax in 2018, because the tax claimed owed wasn't identified or defined, and he wouldn't know what he was pleading to or answering because he wasn't told what the constitutional foundation for the tax claim was or even what the nature of the tax that was being pursued was, direct or indirect. And that without that information, it was impossible for any defendant to answer such a vague, arbitrary, and capricious complaint simply demanding monies be paid. I'd like to throw in a side here that if you aren't told whether the taxes are indirect or indirect, you don't know whether to argue there's a problem with the apportionment limitation applicable to direct taxes or the uniformity of limitation applicable to indirect taxes. So your answer is going to go to either apportionment or uniformity as one of the requirements for the tax to be legitimate, but they won't tell you if it's direct or indirect, so how do you know which argument to take up? You don't. So the court needs to make the plaintiff state what they're doing so that the complaints can be answered, and they're not requiring that. So all of the Americans being charged civilly are being forced to answer vague, arbitrary complaints that can't be answered because you aren't told what you're accused of failing to do, specifically the nature of the tax. So let's go on. Then the district court itself also refused to address the requirement to properly establish the constitutional foundation for the subject matter jurisdiction of the court to enforce the tax allegedly at issue, undefined as it was. Under the U.S. Constitution, by clearly showing on the record of the action in the court, one, the specific taxing power granted, two, the enabling enforcement clause, giving Congress the U.S. authority to write law, giving the U.S. Congress the authority to write law, to enforce that specific taxing power identified in one, and three, the only part of subject matter jurisdiction that the plaintiff United States did provide the statutes providing for the enforcement of the as of yet unidentified vague and arbitrary any tax. But it's not really just any tax that's enforceable. It's any constitutionally granted taxing power that is also constitutionally made enforceable at law for which law has been written. So without properly establishing the subject matter jurisdiction of the district court to entertain the action, and without any actual trial of any evidence or statutes, and without any jury being involved, the district court granted default judgment to the government because Cromar would not answer a complaint that did not properly and fully identify the accusations made within it, sufficient to allow the accusations to be answered at law by any defendant or attorney in the country. And then, before any appeal in the U.S. Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals could be heard, the district court refused to stay enforcement of the judgment pending appeals, ordered the Cromars' house and property seized under judicial order to enforce the default judgment, and then the court ordered the home to be auctioned and sold off, which was then done in a manner that clearly violated the laws controlling that process. So the district court literally stole the man's property, acted without subject matter jurisdiction, claiming authority under statutes alone. Next on appeal in the Tenth Circuit, the plaintiff United States changed their argument regarding the subject matter jurisdiction of the court that could be lawfully taken, admitting in the Circuit Court of Appeals that it was necessary to have a constitutional foundation to the claim. And allegedly arguing that it was the 16th Amendment, they argued, that was serving as the constitutional foundation for the claims for tax made in the complaint filed in the lower district court against Mr. Cromar. Now, 
any person who has studied even just a bit of law can tell you that litigants are not allowed to change, plaintiffs specifically, are not allowed to change in the higher appeals court their argument for the subject matter jurisdiction of the court. They can't change the subject matter jurisdiction or the argument made to establish that jurisdiction in the lower court. Just the changing of the argument is alone sufficient to establish that there was no proper establishment of the subject matter jurisdiction in the lower court, which voids the judgment of the lower court for lack of jurisdiction because the defect had to be corrected in the circuit court. That means the district court proceeded without jurisdiction. Everything it did is void and should be vacated because the court had indeed acted unlawfully because it acted without the subject matter jurisdiction to act at all. Statutes alone are not sufficient to establish the jurisdiction of the court, and that's the defective argument the district court accepted. And then in the circuit court, the United States changed its argument to be the 16th Amendment. Just the change alone, just the change alone voids the unlawful sale of the home. This is a story of the judges stealing the property of American citizens. That fact was proven to be true in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals when the plaintiff changed their jurisdictional argument in that court, admitting for the first time, surprise, that there did need to be a constitutional foundation for a claim that tax was owed. And then arguing erroneously that the foundation was alleged to be the 16th Amendment, which of course is not possible in a criminal trial for lack of an enabling enforcement clause therein to authorize the U.S. Congress to write law thereunder, civil or criminal. And that is also not what the Supreme Court ruled in the decisions it took in 1916 in Vershaver versus Union Pacific Railroad Company, 240 U.S. 1, 1916, and Stanton v. Baltic Mining, 240 U.S. 107 in 1916. And also, that is not what the U.S. Congressional Research Service has been telling the American people in report number 79-131A for 50 years. And it's not what the Congress, the U.S. Congress declared was the constitutional foundation for the income tax, with this constitutional foundation declared on the congressional record in November of 2018, just before it reenacted the federal personal income tax in December of that year, signed by President Trump. And the constitutional authority statement for the income tax enacted says it's un enacted under authority of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, and not under any authority of the 16th Amendment. This is according to Congress as recently as 2018 in their stated intent in the congressional record to justify the enactment of the new legislation. It's not a direct tax. It never has been. The district courts, the circuit courts are lying to America. The Supreme Court says indirect. Congress says indirect. The Congressional Research Service says indirect. The Constitution, the 16th Amendment, doesn't contain the word direct. It's not a direct tax under the 16th Amendment on labor. It's an indirect tax in the form of the imposed duty or excise, where the amount of tax is measured by income. Income is not the object of the tax nor the subject of taxation. It is the yardstick by which the amount of tax owed on earnings derived from activity subject to some impost duty or excise. If there's no impost on foreign activity, duty on exported goods, or excise on commodities, licenses, or corporation, there is no tax to measure by how much gross income you allegedly made. They've swapped constitutionally taxable income under impost duty and excise for Section 63's taxable income relating to gross income under Section 61. I've got other <coughs> YouTube videos that expose the fact that Section 61 came from the Canadian Tax Treaty of 1918. It was Canadian Tax Treaty law that expired in 1993, and it's been dead letter law for 31 years. So it's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1. 
But when Mr. Cromar made that factually correct argument in the district court and in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals on appeal in his civil case seven years ago, he was told by both courts that that was a frivolous argument. It was frivolous to argue that it is Article I, Section 8 that is the actual constitutional foundation for the federal personal income tax, and his appeals were summarily dismissed without honest consideration or analysis being made in or provided by either court. So five years passed, during which there were a number of unsuccessful attempts by Mr. Cromar in both federal and Utah state courts to seek relief and legal redress for the wrong done to him by the collective elements of the federal government involved in the theft of his property. The IRS, the DOJ, the federal courts, the federal judges. Which brings us to today where, in the same federal court as before, Mr. Cromar has now been wrongfully charged again with alleged violations of three criminal tax statutes for allegedly committing violations of three Title 26 tax laws by opposing the wrongful enforcement by the court and the marshal service of the court-ordered Title 28 judgment. And get this. Now in the criminal trial, when challenged again by Defendant Cromart to identify and establish the subject matter jurisdiction of the court that can be lawfully taken, the plaintiff United States again refused to argue other than to argue that jurisdiction over the criminal charges could again be taken by the court under statutes alone, as erroneously argued previously in the civil case. And that, again, no constitutional foundation was necessary to be identified to establish the jurisdiction of the court to enforce tax law. Again, the United States refused as plaintiff to identify the required constitutional foundation for the alleged tax, just as they had fraudulently done so six years before in the civil trial. And when Defendant Cromar pointed out, there is no enabling enforcement clause in the 16th Amendment for the court to show that Congress was constitutionally authorized to write criminal law to enforce this alleged newly created power to tax directly under, a 16, under authority of the 16th Amendment without any applicable limitation, the government again refused to argue in answer or reply. So again, the district court decided it needed to help the United States prosecute its criminal case now, civil case before, and thus began arguing for them, explaining at a hearing, the judge explaining at a hearing, without argument from the plaintiff United States or opposition to the defendant's motions, that the jurisdiction of the court was taken under Article 1, Section 8, where the enabling enforcement clause therein enabled Congress to write law to enforce the tax crimes alleged. When Cromar pointed out that the court was judicially stopped by the previous rulings of the same district court and the circuit court, that the previous 16th Amendment holdings in the same district court affirmed on appeal by the 10th Circuit with the same litigant on the same issue, and thus the court was barred, stopped from taking jurisdiction under Article 1, Section 8, specifically because of those previous rulings and because that claim had been deemed frivolous in the district court and the Tenth Circuit Court too, seven years before when the defendant advanced the argument. So today the district court is trying to use the exact argument that the court said was frivolous when Cromar advanced it seven years ago as a civil defendant. And now the court itself is trying to use it to establish an alleged jurisdiction over three criminal charges which he apparently knows can't take a jurisdiction under the 16th Amendment, so now he's switched to Article 1, Section 8. So the district court is now blatantly and patently violating the three controlling and now applicable legal doctrines of collateral estoppel, judicial estoppel, and estoppel by judgment that all work under this case's circumstances to prevent and bar or stop a court or a litigant, like the United States, from using a reversal of their previously successful argument or decision to continue ruling against the same opposing litigant in the same or subsequent litigation. A decision already made by the courts cannot be redecided on the contrary in subsequent litigation in order to continue 
litigation in a manner that ensures only one side constantly wins and the other side constantly loses in each and every trial litigated. These legal doctrines of collateral estoppel, judicial estoppel, and estoppel by judgment declare and command that once an issue, like the subject matter jurisdiction of the court that can be lawfully taken to enforce tax law, once the issue has been settled by the court, it cannot be changed later in the litigation. Neither that same litigation or subsequent litigation that occurs between the same two litigants. All parties are legally bound by what was previously settled, and the district court in the criminal trial is now bound in that criminal action by what was held in the previous civil action. And the district court is now wrongfully trying to use a reversal of the decision taken in the civil action in order to desperately reach out to find and use a required enabling enforcement clause, which is necessary to show that Congress was constitutionally authorized to write the criminal law to criminally enforce a direct tax without limitation against American citizens allegedly created under authority of the 16th Amendment. There is no constitutional authority given to Congress to write law to enforce a new taxing power under authority of the 16th Amendment alone. There is no enabling enforcement clause in the amendment. There is no authority conferred on Congress to write law under the amendment. Every single civil and criminal action for 85 years has been conducted by a court without subject matter jurisdiction. As they insist, you owe the tax because of the 16th Amendment. That's the judges lying to you. Judicial legislation is what they're enforcing. Their own opinions. They're violating the Constitution. This is specifically why the Supreme Court rejected the argument in 1916 that a direct tax was authorized under the amendment, ruling in both Bruchaber and Baltic Mining Supra that the tax was inherently indirect. Since lawful indirect taxation by duty, impost, and excise does not reach the labors or the fruits of labor of the American people derived from activities conducted by right, and which fruits are not derived from participation in any federally taxable activity or privilege subject to impost duty or excise taxation, then there can be no tax that reaches the labors of the American people with legal effect as a tax under Article 1. Impost duty and excise don't get there. Impost taxes foreigners and foreign persons, foreign activity and foreign imposts. Imports, duty, tax, be goods being taken out of the country and excise tax commodities, licenses, and corporations. None of those powers reach labor with legal effect as a tax. So, and since there is no enabling enforcement clause in the 16th Amendment to authorize the U.S. Congress to write law, Neither the District Court nor the U.S. Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals were able to properly establish the subject matter jurisdiction of the courts in the previous civil action against Mr. Cromar seven years before. And thus, that judgment is rendered void and should have been vacated when the Plaintiff United States changed its argument for jurisdiction in the higher Tenth Circuit Court. The change of argument alone renders void the district court's default judgment in the civil action. Remember, they took jurisdiction under statutes alone. They got into the circuit court and argued, oh, we're sorry, it wasn't statutes alone. It's really the 16th Amendment with statutes. Well, when you change your argument, you void the judgment that was rendered by the court that didn't have jurisdiction under statutes alone. It's a fatal defect. They have to start over. And in the criminal action today, the district court again lacks the required subject matter jurisdiction to proceed under the 16th Amendment, as previously held, for lack of an applicable enabling enforcement clause therein. Knowing that fact to be true, the district court judge today frivolously reaches out to Article 1, Section 8 
to find somewhere an enabling enforcement clause it can bring to bear to the new power it made up under the 16th Amendment. And it does so in blatant violation of all three of the now applicable and controlling estoppel doctrines. It's a desperate attempt by the court to find an enabling enforcement clause that it can misrepresent as authoritative to a pro se defendant who isn't supposed to know about the three legal estoppel doctrines. This is all basic and fundamental law being blatantly violated by the district court in Utah, Central Division, Salt Lake City, in order to pursue criminal charges against an innocent man. The court has now conspiratorially reversed their previous holding that it was the 16th Amendment under which a jurisdiction is taken, specifically because there is no enabling enforcement clause in it to authorize Congress to write criminal law to use against American citizens. So to find an authority for the criminal law to be written and used, it has to violate the estoppel doctrines and fraudulently reach out to Article 1, Section 8, which again was held to be a frivolous argument in the civil action when Cromar advanced it. But now that argument is being invoked and relied upon by the same district court that rejected it and labeled it frivolous to now allow the court to use it to justify and conduct the criminal trial of Mr. Cromar. This is as seditious as it gets from the courts, people. This case can end the income tax law. Talk about a clear judicial fraud being intentionally committed in a desperate attempt, allegedly to establish the three elements necessary for subject matter jurisdiction to exist. Again, one, power granted. Two, authority given to Congress to write law. Three, Congress wrote the law cited for the purpose alleged. Never before, and God willing, never again can this be done to an American. Additionally, in Ken's ongoing criminal case, or trial is scheduled to begin this week on Tuesday, May 21st already, he has been given no legal service of the United States court filings and pleadings for over four months while in jail before trial. The plaintiff United States has failed to make timely discovery disclosures of its alleged evidence, has failed to plead in reply to multiple motions to dismiss from the defendant, instead relying on the court to prejudicially argue for the plaintiff, or to just summarily, repeatedly, deny the unopposed motions without honest consideration for their substance and the points of law made within them drawn from the quoted language of the statutes themselves. Additionally, Ken has been given no evidence during discovery that satisfies the evidentiary standards set by the applicable controlling statute, i.e., admissible evidence that is, quote, prima facie good and sufficient for all legal purposes, end quote, as specified in law under IRC section 6020B2, 6020B2. Thus, this trial, like all federal personal income tax trials and cases conducted today, both civil and criminal, is all 100% complete, improper fraud committed and perpetrated only through judicial legislation. And they are throwing Americans into jail and into prison on fraudulent charges and claims for unauthorized taxes while fraudulently stealing the property of good Americans under the guise and pretense of taxation and tax enforcement in order to propagate this fraudulent system of unauthorized, non-uniform, graduated tax which is neither uniform nor apportioned to the states nor laid in proportion to the census. It has no limitation at all applied to its operational enforcement practices within the IRS, which is not de jour and is only de facto. It is clearly an unconstitutional enforcement of, a, of the granted taxing powers that are made enforceable, and the lower federal courts have been acting in this perversely treasonous and subversively seditious manner for over 65 years now and getting away with it 
by bamboozling virtually all of America and nearly all Americans about the 16th Amendment. Just like they tried to do with COVID, gain-of-function viral research, and the fictional Russian dossier about Donald Trump that was criminally abused in the FISA courts, who let them get away with it. But this tax case is going to the Supreme Court, where, like in Dodd overturning Roe v. Wade, and SFFA v. UNC, and SFFA versus Harvard overturning affirmative action, and soon, like Loper Bright Enterprises v. Raimundo and Relentless Inc. v. Department of Commerce, which threatens to overturn agency regulatory deference with respect to the force of law made applicable by regulations that go beyond the statute. In other words, they're going to strike down the department and agency's ability to write law in place of Congress's writing law, where Congress says they can write the regulations. They can only write the regulations that do what the statute allows. This is going to fall. They're not going to be allowed to write law by regulations anymore. So this Supreme Court is faithfully and surely correcting all of the unconstitutional errors made in the socialist and expansive decisions of the federal courts that occurred in the 1960s. Just like the judicial legislation of the 1960s, just like that legislation did by erroneously declaring the federal personal income tax to be a direct tax without limitation under the 16th Amendment. It's the same era. All of those reverse decisions came out of the same era where this income tax ruling that it's a direct tax under the 16th Amendment. They're enforcing socialism, not constitutional taxation. They're enforcing the second plank of the Communist Manifesto, not Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, and not any tax under the 16th Amendment. It's perversion, it's subversion, it's treason, it's sedition being committed by the judges, being committed by the judges knowingly and intentionally knowingly and intentionally. Did it all with judicial legislation in the 60s. It's not a direct tax. It's a tax under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 in the form of an impost on foreign activity, duties on exported goods or goods being taken out of the country for sale, resale or consumption, and on excises, as excises, on commodities and privileges. And those three powers, impost, duty, and excise, are all made enforceable by law by a constitutionally authorized Congress under the original Necessary and Proper Enabling Enforcement Clause of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, which does authorize Congress to write law, civil, and criminal to enforce the impost, duty, and excise taxes. And those are the only forms of taxation authorized to be enforced at law by the Constitution. Nothing under the 16th Amendment is authorized to be enforced. Nothing. That's part of the reason why the Supreme Court said it's not a direct tax under the 16th Amendment. They rejected that argument. So, the question now becomes, what will the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals do now with the interlocutory appeal that Mr. Cromar has just filed to see if the Circuit Court will also contradict itself and the previous ruling and judgment that it affirmed and upheld? in order to continue summarily ruling against Mr. Cromar as a tax defendant and itself, the court, violate, like the district court already has, the three controlling legal estoppel doctrines and allow the district court to continue conducting the criminal trial of defendant Cromar under alleged authority of Article 1, Section 8, instead of under the previously decided and settled 16th Amendment as foundation. Thus, also violating the estoppel doctrines, which now dictate that the courts can only claim the foundational use of the 16th Amendment for the criminal trial, as previously decided through a judgment in the civil court in that same district court. This, of course, all means that the courts, the federal court, district court, must either dismiss with prejudice the current criminal action against Mr. Cromar for lack of subject matter jurisdiction under the 16th Amendment, 
for lack of the required enabling enforcement clause that authorizes Congress to write criminal enforcement law or would authorize them to write law under the 16th Amendment, or if the Tenth Circuit allows the district court to continue with the criminal trial of Defendant Cromar under alleged authority of Article I, Section 8, then the circuit court renders void the previous affirmed civil judgment against Cromar, which must be vacated for lack of the required subject matter jurisdiction in that court when it rendered the civil judgment under first in the district court statutes alone, and then on appeal in the Tenth Circuit under allegedly the 16th Amendment alone with the statutes. And that opens the door to Mr. Cromar filing a multi-million dollar civil action for being cheated and defrauded out of his home and property six years ago by a federal court that lacked the subject matter jurisdiction necessary to so act without an enabling enforcement clause that factually, constitutionally authorized the U.S. Congress to write law allegedly relied upon by the court at that time to seize, auction, sell, and convert his home and property in the name of tax, under color of law, under color of judicial office. Without subject matter jurisdiction, the court had no office to act from. Clearly, this case has the potential to end the federal income tax system, as America thinks they know it today, which system has relied upon this now completely exposed misapplication and maladministration of the tax laws by the IRS, the DOJ, and the federal courts themselves, and its unconstitutional enforcement by the district courts and circuit courts too, as they effectively wrongfully enforce what can now easily be recognized as nothing but the second plank of the Communist Manifesto which reads, a heavy, progressive, or graduated income tax. And that, my friends, is where you find non-uniform graduated taxation, the second plank of the Communist Manifesto, constituting and instituting the class warfare of communism and destroying unified representation of we the people by the members of Congress, who are now compelled to pick one class or the other to represent and never represent the whole unified people. This graduated and different class treatment of the American people under the non-uniform indirect tax laws is prohibited by the U.S. Constitution under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1. And all direct taxes are still required to be apportioned to the states for payment and laid in proportion to the census, as required by Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, and Article 1, Section 9, Clause 4. This is true regardless of the adoption of the 16th Amendment. According to the Supreme Court, this is true, specifically because these limiting clauses of Article of 1, 2, 3, and 1, 9, 4 were not repealed nor amended in conjunction with the adoption of the 16th Amendment in 1913. The amendment makes no exception under those articles. It's not referenced, it's not repealed, it's not amended, and the amendment doesn't say accepted from those provisions. So it was precisely for these reasons that the Supreme Court held in 1916 in the original income tax cases that the income tax was not a new power to tax directly and without limitation created by the 16th Amendment. And the reasons are more, even more obvious when one realizes that the word direct is not actually in the amendment in describing the tax addressed therein. And it is especially true because there is no enabling enforcement clause in the amendment to authorize the U.S. Congress to write any new law or to authorize existing law to be utilized to enforce any alleged new power allegedly newly created thereunder under the amendment without any constitutional limitation being applicable to this newly invented tax of unlimited power. Without the authority to write law being plainly and clearly given to Congress by an enabling enforcement clause of the 16th Amendment, the amendment cannot be the source of legal authority in the federal courts for any legal action, civil or criminal, 
against an American citizen. Again, neither civil nor criminal. And there can be no grant of any new power, new, new direct power to tax that would be enforceable against we the American people because the word direct is not in the amendment and the indirect tax authorized on income cannot be interpreted as being direct without engineering and manufacturing an inherent irreconcilable conflict within the Constitution itself between this interpretation of the 16th Amendment that adds the word, and it's by just adding a word and ignoring a fatal omission, the Enabling Enforcement Clause, that is essential and required in order for the court to be able to establish and show that it can take subject matter jurisdiction over the action, civil or criminal. The provisions of Article 1 at 123 and 194 have never been repealed or amended. They still operate to impose the limitations applicable to all direct taxation regardless of the adoption of the amendment. And these two courts, the district court and the circuit court, are now laser focused on taking to the Supreme Court. We are taking this to the Supreme Court to strike down this nonsensical argument that it's the 16th Amendment that causes you to owe the tax. And they don't have to show an authority to write law and that there are no longer any limitations on the taxing power. This is all nonsense. It's the government that's making the frivolous argument. The fact that the district court has to reach out to Article One and violate the collateral estoppel doctrine and violate the judicial estoppel and violate the estoppel by judgment to find an enabling enforcement clause in Article One when Ken was told that's a frivolous argument, Article One. So the court's now using a frivolous argument to allegedly establish jurisdiction to conduct a criminal trial of the defendant. This is perversion and subversion being committed by the judges to accompany their judicial legislation of making it all up. And if you want to understand how it's all been made up, head on over to tax-freedom.com and start reading, or head on over to irszoom.com and pick yourself up a copy of The Simple Truth About Income Tax for $4. Four. That's $4. 75-page PDF download that exposes all of this information together with informing you and educating you about what really happened in 1913 under the legislation they passed which was the Underwood-Simmons Tariff Act of October 3rd, 1913. The tariff is one form of an impost, which as I just got through explaining, is the power to tax foreign activity and foreign persons. And that's why from 1913 to 1942, there was no authority in the law to collect the income tax from American citizens, only non-resident aliens and foreign corporations. So if you want to get informed, you want to get educated, you want to know what's going on, you want to know how you got enslaved and how they're continuing to keep you trapped financially, even if it's not enslavement with whips and change, they've substituted financial extortion for the whips and chains. If you want to be informed, you want to know what's going on, get over to taxfreedom.com or irszoom.com. Buy yourself a copy of The Simple Truth About Income Tax or The American Tax Bible. It's an 800-page PDF that lays out everything from beginning to end. $50. Get informed, America. They're taking America away and they're about to apply the coup de grace, the killing blow that settles the matter forever. Okay, this is Thomas Freed on that Thomas Freed YouTube channel. Like the video, share the video, subscribe, get informed. Take back America. Take back your paycheck. Take back your freedom. Take back your right to live under God instead of government's mandates.